So, how can we explain this apparent faster-than-light motion? Surely that's impossible. Well, to get our heads around this, we have to think about what precisely we are measuring. What we'll do is we'll have a telescope, a radio telescope, very, well, to be precise, a network of radio telescopes, very long based on interferometry, and we will see the nucleus of our quasar and a blob. And at one time it's here, at a later time it's moved to there. Now what we can measure is the change in position, delta r, and we know the change in time, delta t. That's the time between our observations. Okay, and we therefore infer that the velocity equals delta r divided by delta t. Seems pretty straightforward. But there are two complications here, one involving the r and one involving the t. Let's start off with a complication involving the r. We are measuring the apparent sideways motion. But in addition to moving sideways away from the quasar, these blobs may be moving towards us or away from us. So let's imagine we are looking from over here, and we have a quasar, and it's squirting blobs out at this angle here. All we actually see is this component of the motion. We don't see that component of the motion at all. So that distance is r, and this angle here, the angle to the line of sight, is theta. What we observe as delta r is actually, delta r observed, is actually the real r times sine theta. If something's moving straight towards us, for example, we won't see it move at all. The blob will just sit on top here. If it's at right angles, then the r observed is the same as the r actually moved, and if it's somewhere in between, it's going to be some fraction given by sine theta. So, does that solve our problem? Well, no, that's going to make delta r observed smaller. So that's going to mean our velocity will appear less than the true velocity. It's not going to make it appear more than the true velocity. So that means it must be going even faster than light to produce what we observe if it's at some angle. So that's important, but it doesn't really help us. What else can we look at here? Well, let's see what's wrong with the delta t. Our delta t, remember we're taking two observations at two different times, separated by delta t, and we see the radiation that was coming from there is now coming from there. But there's a complication here. Once again, let's imagine that a quasar is firing a blob of plasma at close to the line of sight. And once again, we have an angle theta in here. Now, you might think that the time that elapses for the quasar between there and there is the same that the time elapses on Earth between the observations. But you'd be wrong, because let's imagine some light sets out from here. It's got to travel this distance to reach the Earth. But light coming from here only has to travel a smaller distance to reach the Earth. Because it's got a smaller distance to go than that light, it will appear relatively earlier. So what is the delta t observed? Well, imagine we have a pulse that sets out from here, and there's some time there t, and then another pulse gets from there. Now the pulse that set out from here will have travelled a distance ct, Meanwhile, this blob has travelled distance along the line of sight, which is that length there, which is r cos theta. So the light coming from here has a head start on the light coming from there. It's not starting from the same place. So the time interval that we observe on Earth will not be the time interval that takes light to get from there to there, but only the time interval that takes light to get from there to there. That distance there is going to be ct minus r cos theta. OK, so let's combine these things. Apparent velocity, the v observed, is going to be apparent distance, which is going to be r sine theta over the apparent time. Apparent time is going to be c t minus r, and r is just v times t, so v t cos theta or divided by c. That's the existence light has to go divided by the speed of light. 
and also up here we know that r is actually just equal to vt again. So that comes out. Let's make the substitution that beta equals the fraction of the speed of light. That comes out as beta sine theta all over 1 minus beta cos theta times the speed of light. So that's how fast things are going to appear to travel. Now this top, the sine theta, is going to make things appear slower, but the bottom, the 1 minus beta cos theta, if beta is quite close to the speed of light and theta is small and therefore cos theta is close to 1, you're getting 1 minus a number that's almost 1. So that could make the bottom very small and make the apparent velocity very large. Is it enough to cancel out the sine theta effect? Well, let's do a calculation of that. I've produced plots of the apparent velocity as a function of angle to the line of sight for different values of beta. Here's a plot for beta equals 0.7, so something travelling at 70% of the speed of light. And what you can see here is that at angles of around 40 to 50 degrees, the apparent motion is actually faster than the true motion. At small angles or large angles, it's much less. A speed of 0.7c wasn't enough to give us apparent superluminal motion, but here's the plot for 0.9c, and you can see now that at angles of between 20 and 30 degrees from the line of sight, the apparent velocity can be up to twice the speed of light. So we are getting superluminal motion. If we take the velocity even further still, all the way up to 0.99% of the speed of light, you can see that you can get extremely fast speeds, up to seven times the apparent speed of light, for angles that are only about 10 degrees off the line of sight. So that's our explanation for this apparent superluminal motion. The quasar is firing something very close to the line of sight to the Earth. Because it's so close to the line of sight of the Earth, its apparent sideways speed is reduced. But on the other hand, the light from this thing almost catches up with the light from earlier epochs, which means that the time is enormously compressed. If we take two observations a year apart, it could well be light that was actually emitted 100 years apart, but because it's going at 99% of the speed of light, it's almost caught up with the light from the earlier bits. And so it turns out that for angles not quite on the line of sight, but only a small way off, and speeds very close to the speed of light, this effect of catching up with its own light and therefore compressing the time more than compensates for the small angle and gives us motions which can be extremely fast. It also explains the one-sided nature of the jets. Probably these quasars are also firing a jet out that direction. But if you remember from relativity, when something's moving close to the speed of light, most of its radiation is beamed out in a narrow angle forwards. So what's happening is the light from blobs going this way mostly comes out in these directions. And the light from blob in this direction mostly comes out in these directions. So we just can't see the blobs over here. They're beaming the light in a different direction. We only see the ones on this side, which explains why the jets are so one-sided. The compression of time, because it's almost catching up with its own light, also explains how these things can vary so very, very fast. They're actually not varying that fast. It's just that they're varying and moving towards us, so the apparent time of variation is compressed because of the motion. So it all seems to fit together.